Well, welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's Curator's Corner. My name is Thorin Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. This is an online program that's part of a series of weekly programs that I've been doing for several months that looks in particular at objects and images in our collection to draw attention to those items while our building was closed and even now when our building is open when people are still reluctant to come in large numbers to our museum. But I hope that you will make an appointment, make a reservation and come to our galleries and see these things in person. Um, as always, let me encourage you to pose any questions you have or comments in the Q&A feature of Zoom and I will make sure to answer them at the end of the program. Uh, today, as my finals curator's corner during Women's History Month, and given that the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is coming next week, I wanted to talk about a plaque that's in our Children's Memorial Garden that includes a quote from Vladka Mead. And you can see the plaque here, and here's maybe a little clearer. You, you can see that she said, know that in the most difficult moments, when death is ever present, we try to maintain human dignity. I'm gonna do something a bit different for my Curator's Corner this time than in the past. I'd like to introduce Meryl Menashe, who is one of our docents and educators who knew Vlad Kamid personally later in her life and uh, who was involved in making the decision to choose this quote to put on uh, in our garden. So I'd like to bring Meryl out here and ask her to talk a little about her personal experience of working with Vlad Kamid and of what the quote meant to Meryl. So Meryl. Okay, I'm here. I'm on. I'm on. I'm unmuted. What's going on? Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's hard to sum up all of Vlad Kamid's life experiences in a very short time, but I'm going to do my best to give you an inkling into who she was, what she stood for, and the legacy she left, which is powerful. Vlad Kamid was one of the most courageous and bravest people I was honored to know. In 2008, I was asked to join the Holocaust and Jewish Resistance, Resistance Teachers Program on Vladka's last trip to Poland. Uh, it was fortuitous for me because I really got to know her. The program was established by Vladka and her husband, Ben, survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto, leaders in the resistance and following the war, leaders and pioneers in Holocaust education. They believed they could reach more people with their history through teachers. They speak to audiences, they reach the people in the audience. If their audience is teachers, teachers have a 30 some odd year career with 100 plus students a year, they reach a lot more people. So they created the program and over the years brought 1,100 teachers to Holocaust sites to learn about the horrors firsthand, its lessons, stressing resistance of the Jews, both spiritual and active, and many of those teachers are still in classrooms today, educating their students. If not their students, they're in college classrooms, they're writing books, they're spreading her message all around the world. The quote chosen for the garden represents what was closest to Blotka's heart, that Jews did not go like sheep she to the slaughter, but did their best to live under horrific conditions. The ghetto lived under the surface and she was one of their residents. In fact, in her book, she felt safer in the ghetto than out of the ghetto. Uh, she also had a memoir, Both Sides of the Wall, which gives you more about her life. When she spoke about the lectures in the youth groups, the youth groups had, were created before the war, but during the war, as they more and more became orphans, became families, and they would have lectures in the evening, and those lectures were intellectual and kept them excited and gave them hope. She talks about speaking to younger children, Many of the people that attended those lectures ended up being leaders in the resistance and the uprising. Another anecdote she talks about is her brother. Her brother was gonna be a bar mitzvah. You say a bar mitzvah in the ghetto, yes. Rations were tight, but her mom saved a little bit every day of the rations to give to the teacher so her brother could become a bar mitzvah. As time went on and the ghetto became more and more 
it, the war, it became apparent what was happening outside the walls. Uh, Vladka was on a mission when she learned her mother and her brother were at the Umschlag plot, which was the train station where they waited to board the trains in Warsaw of what many knew was certain death. Most of the Jews were murdered in Treblinka, along with Vladka's family. At that point, she dedicated herself 100% to the resistance. Some personal memories of our time. Uh, we were in the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, watching a film of life in the ghetto and of course the uprising and the end of it. And I was sitting next to her during the film and during the whole time she's pointing and calling out names and she knew a lot of the people in the film and then she started to get very agitated and she got up and left. Also on that trip, we were blessed to have her son and her grandson and her daughter-in-law, which, you know, so it was very important for them as well as all of us. We get to Treblinka, one thing you learn is you don't say no to Vlad to me. So we're in Treblinka and there's a field full of, it's a field of stones with the names of the towns that perished during the war. Vlad in the distance sees a red hair, somebody with red hair. She immediately knows it's Deborah Lipstadt and decides that Deborah has to come have, have dinner with her teachers. Now, Deborah was in the middle of the Irving trial. She was meeting with professors from the Warsaw University that night. She says, Black guy, I can't come. No, you have to come. Well, she came. Uh, she came and she didn't have dinner with us, but she spoke to us. Again, we didn't say no to Vlad Kameev. Another example that's a little bit more lighthearted about not saying no is a bunch of tired teachers get on the bus at 7 a.m. We have a long trip to Auschwitz. Um, Vlad was with us and we're on the bus. And Vladka loved to sing. Her favorite song was Que Sera Sera. So she wanted the teachers to sing her the song at seven in the morning. Fortunately, Stephen was able to convince her to wait a little bit. But about an hour later, we sing to her. They then in return sang us a Yiddish lullaby, which was the most touching thing I've ever seen. And she enjoyed every moment, as did all of us. One thing I want to leave you with, any Holocaust museum you go into, Look at the walls. She's quoted at the United States Holocaust Mu Memorial Museum, Yad Vashem, and Poland, and I'm sure there are many more. So I could speak all day about Vladka, but that's time for Thorin to continue our, our talk on Vladka and the Warsaw Ghetto. Thank you very much. Thanks, Meryl. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it. You know, you bring uh, a personal connection that I could never to talking about Vladka. And so I appreciate your willingness to share those memories and to talk a little about her. Thank you. Um, let me just click on a few more buttons here, get myself back in position. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, to fill in some additional details and bring some additional information in building on, where, on what Merrill just shared and offer some of the larger history of what happened in Warsaw during World War II. Um, sorry, one more button here. Um, um, Vlad Kamid, there she is, was born as Fegla Peltel in a Jewish family in Warsaw in December of 1921. She grew up in a largely secular Jewish household, becoming an active member of a youth organization that was opposed to Zionism and instead advocated for the celebration of Yiddish language as a culture, as part of a Jewish nationalism that was tied to Poland rather than to an Israeli state. Unlike many Jews in Poland, Vladka learned Polish as a child, learning it in a, as a second language in her secular school. And later she was able to use those Polish language skills and her supposedly Aryan features to pass as a non-Jew, taking the name Vladka to fit in in Poland under Nazi rule. Her life, of course, was ripped apart by World War II. The Nazis invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, and marched into Warsaw on September 29th. Vladka was 18 years old. In November of 1939, all the Jewish residents of Warsaw were required to wear a white armband with a blue star to identify them as Jews. And for the fall in, in, over the course of the following year, Vladka and the other Jewish residents of Warsaw faced gradual increases on restrictions. So the closing of all Jewish schools, the confiscation of Jewish property, 
the conscription of Jewish men to forced labor. And then in October of 1940, the Nazis decreed the establishment of a ghetto in Warsaw. The decree required all Jewish residents of Warsaw to move into this designated area, which German authorities sealed off from the rest of the city in November of 1940 with a 10 foot high wall. Once the Jewish residents of Warsaw were in the ghetto, Jews from the surrounding cities and towns were brought to Warsaw and added to the Warsaw ghetto population. At its height, more than 450,000 Jews were squeezed into an area of 1.3 square miles, an average of more than seven people for every room in the ghetto. With the sealing off of the ghetto, the Nazis also restricted the flow of food and medicine into the area so that uh, the average uh, Jew in the Warsaw Ghetto had only about a, a thousand or eleven hundred calories of food per day, and yet were required to work full days. Some 83,000 Jews died of starvation during the first 18 months. Her father died of pneumonia in the ghetto, also probably fostered by his poor diet and the lack of medicine. Then in July of 1942, the Nazis announced that they would be deporting residents of the ghetto for resettlement. Vladka later wrote how there were all kinds of rumors floating around in Warsaw about what did resettlement mean. Some believed the German authorities that resettlement was going to be taking people to a better place. But Vladka heard firsthand a description by a man who had escaped from Treblinka and made it back to Warsaw and he described the mass murder that was taking place there. So she believed that and avoided deportation in any way she could. She was lucky in a couple of key moments, but as Merrill said, she could do nothing to stop the fact that her mother, sister, and brother were deported and murdered. They were some of the 265,000 Jews murdered at Treblinka. As more and more of the Jews were deported, more and more news trickled in about Nazis murdering the Jewish communities all around. The divisions that had previously divided Jews in the ghetto about whether or not to resist fell away. And in October of 1942, Vladka attended a meeting where she learned of a Jewish coordinating committee that was organi organizing armed resistance in the ghetto. The first steps were to establish coordination of resistance with various different groups in the ghetto, to make contact with non-Jewish sympathizers outside the ghetto, and to smuggle as many women and children out of the ghetto as possible. Vladka wrote, preparations for direct action were underway. The ungratified desire for revenge, which each of us had secretly harbored, was now to emerge. We had to become reconciled to the idea of death. We knew that all roads led towards it. Vladka managed to sneak out of the ghetto and began to work from outside the walls to smuggle weapons and other supplies into the ghetto. And she also worked to smuggle Jewish children over the ghetto walls and into the safe care of Polish Gentiles. But no placement was guaranteed to be safe and all placements involved the ripping apart of families. On January 18th, 1943, Vladka was living on the Aryan side of the wall, outside of the ghetto, when she heard a different type of gunfire emanating from the ghetto. A group of Jewish fighters, with some of the supplies that she had provided, armed with pistols and uh, various other weapons, had joined a column of Jews that were being marched to, be to the deportation point. At a pre-range signal, those fighters broke ranks and started attacking the Nazis. In the chaos that followed, the other Jews who had been marched off for deep, were being marched off for deportation were able to flee and hide. In the wake of that initial battle, most of the Jewish fighters involved lay dead, and the Nazis went ahead and rounded up four to five thousand Jews from within the ghetto to take away but they then suspended further deportations. The Nazis then regrouped and began planning for the complete emptying and liquidation of the ghetto, the murder of all the Jews in the ghetto. 
information leaked to the ghetto resistance groups that in mid-April of 1943, the Nazis would enter the ghetto and begin rounding up all the Jews there. The resistance began to prepare for that final battle. Vladka helped gather gasoline, dynamite, and other chemicals from all over the city of Warsaw to be brought to the ghetto where fighters could make their own explosives. And on April 18th, 1943, the day before Passover that year, Nazi troops surrounded the ghetto, and in the following morning they marched in, but they were met by the new resistance. Uh, that resistance, with whatever weapons they had been able to gather, started to fight back. Vladka, again, was outside the ghetto when the fighting started. She tried to get to the walls to help get anyone out, but was blocked. After six days of fighting, she watched as Nazi troops in the ghetto set buildings on fire to spur Jews out of their hiding places. She described what she saw. The gunfire continued sporadically throughout the night. The screams of agony had ceased. An eerie stillness prevailed over Sventoyerska and Vovova streets. The blazing buildings turned night into day. The only sound, the crackling of the dry lumber of the houses, the occasional collapse of a weakened floor or ceiling. All night I stood before the open window as if in shock, my face feeling the heat of the fire, my eyes smarting from the smoke, watching the entire ghetto go up in flames. The fires that Vladko watched that night went on for more than a month, because although German forces broke the organized military resistance within a first, the first few days, individuals and small groups hid and fought against the Germans up into May. Finally, on May 16, 1943, the German commander, SS General Jürgen Stroop, ordered the destruction of the Great Warsaw Synagogue to symbolize the Nazi victory over the resistance. Stroop went on to submit a 125-page report to his superiors, recounting the German suppression of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and the liquidation of the ghetto in the spring of 1943. By the middle of May, he reported that the ghetto was in ruins. He had captured 56,000 Jews, destroyed 631 bunkers. He estimated that his units had killed 7,000 Jews during the uprising, and another 7,000 had been deported to Treblinka, where almost all were certainly killed in the gas chambers. And you see Stroop here in the middle of this photo. For months after the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto, individual Jews continued to hide themselves in the ruins on occasion and attack German police or other Nazis when they were on patrol. Meanwhile, outside of the ghetto walls, Vladka was one of perhaps as many as 20,000 Jews who continued to live in hiding. The Nazis also targeted these Jews, launching various raids and following up on tips. Vladka was rounded up several times, but managed to escape every one. Finally, she managed to get all the, a full set of documents that said she was a not, uh, she said she was non, not a Jew and that she was allowed to live in Warsaw. But uh, with those papers, she moved out of Warsaw, but continued to remain tied to the resistance effort to help Jews find safe places to stay, to get false documents for them, and to coordinate other assistance. By the summer of 1944, Vladka had become one of the couriers who was distributing money donated by Americans or other outside sources to various resistance groups. In that role, she returned to Warsaw to help with the second uprising, this one led by the Polish Home Army, the non-Jewish Polish resistance, although assisted by whatever Jewish fighters were left. By then, the Nazis had been forced to retreat and the Red Army was approaching Warsaw. The Polish Home Army hoped that if they launched an attack against the Nazis in Warsaw, the Red Army would come to their aid and push the Germans out. On August 1st, 1944, the Warsaw Uprising, as distinct from the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, started. The fighting went on for 63 days in what was the single largest military effort taken by any resistance movement during World War II. 
The Red Army, however, refused to join in, choosing instead to let the Nazis and Poles kill each other. Initially, the Polish forces succeeded in pushing the Nazis back, but the Germans brought in reinforcements and launched a counteroffensive that included going from house to house, murdering anyone they found. The goal of the Nazis was to undermine the Polish willingness to fight. Although the exact number of casualties is unknown, it's estimated that about 16,000 members of the Polish resistance were killed and about 6,000 more badly wounded. In addition, between 150 and 200,000 Polish civilians died, mostly from mass executions. The Polish Home Army finally capitulated on October 2nd, 1944. In the aftermath of the fighting, SS Chief Heinrich Himmler ordered the complete destruction of the city of Warsaw. In an order dated October 17th, he wrote, the city must completely disappear from the surface of the earth and serve only as a transport station for the Wehrmacht. No stone can remain standing. Every building must be raised to its foundation. By the time he wrote that order, Warsaw was already severely damaged. The Warsaw Ghetto, which made up about 15% of the city, had already been raised. Another quarter of the city was destroyed due to the fighting from 1944. And then there was also the damage that dated back to the original attack of the Nazis in 1939. Still, with Hitler's order in hand, the Nazis undertook a block by block approach to leveling the city of Warsaw, destroying 85% of the city's buildings before they were forced to withdraw in January of 1945. And I think you get a sense of this from this aerial photograph of just the complete destruction in Warsaw. This is another view uh, on the ground. And I've got one more, although I know this is small, but this panoramic view, I think is, if you can see it, it really does show the city's widespread destruction. Vladka Mead returned to Warsaw shortly after the end of the war. She described that visit as part of a series of articles she wrote in 1946 and 1947 for the Jewish Daily Forward, which were later published in 1948 as a book entitled On Both Sides of the Wall. Describing her visit to the ghetto or what had been the ghetto, she said, quiet, heart, stop racing so. There's nothing and no one to be afraid of. Don't you see that there's no one here, that there are only desolate ruins and rubble and wreckage wherever your eyes turn? So why the fear and trembling? Remember, you have already witnessed horrible scenes here amidst roaring tongues of flame and billowing smoke. True, there was still some small spark of life. There was still a glimmer of hope. I think it's notable that she highlights that there's this glimmer of hope, hope for a revival of the city and hope for a revival of the Jewish community. Not long after her return to Warsaw, Vladka and her husband, who she'd met in the underground in Warsaw, immigrated to New York arriving on only the second ship to bring survivors from Europe to America. In America, however, she embraced her role to teach people what had happened in Europe, becoming a lecturer for the International Rescue Committee and for the Jewish Labor Committee. She was also one of the leaders of the effort to create a Holocaust memorial in Battery Park in New York, and was active in the role to create a national Holocaust memorial and museum. You can see her here with her husband shaking hands with President Jimmy Carter at a ceremony marking the official presentation of the report of the U.S. Holocaust Commission in September of 1979. And as you heard from Merrill, she was the driving force behind efforts to take high school teachers to Europe to show them firsthand where the events of the Holocaust had taken place. The quote we show in our memorial garden is one that is also on display at the Auschwitz Beer Canal. Uh, State Museum, and highlights something less often spoken about in regard to Vladka Mead. Most people know of her active role in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and her active involvement in the larger Polish resistance movement. But this quote shows that those external acts of resistance stemmed from her mental resistance and her unwillingness to give up her humanity. 
in the face of unspeakable horror and hatred, she held on to the need to maintain human dignity. She refused to be brought down to the level of the Nazis. That internal strength and resistance is something we choose to highlight in our garden. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, thank you for watching. And of course, if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature to type them in. Before I get to go to those, let me remind you of some other upcoming programs. Next Wednesday, I'll be back for my next Curator's Corner speaking about a photograph in our exhibition that shows canisters of the poison Zyklon B in storage at the Killing Center at Madonic. I'm gonna talk about how the Nazis or when the Nazis turned to using poison gas and about the chemical conglomerate IG Farben that produced it. Next Thursday, we'll be holding our annual Yom HaShoah commemoration that falls every year on the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. We're focusing this year on the need for the history to be passed down to the next generation. And we'll have both survivors and their grandchildren lighting memorial candles. And the centerpiece of our program will be a short presentation by the descendants of the Bielski family, who are also continuing to pass on their family's role in the resistance to the Nazis during the war. I hope you'll join us to honor both the victims and the survivors of the Holocaust. And one more program to mention on Monday, April 12th at 6.30 in the evening, we'll hold a discussion with the author, author Julie Metz about her new book, Ava and Eve, a search for my mother's lost childhood and what a war left behind. You can find more information about these programs and a full listing of all our upcoming programs on our website at www.hmtcli.org and then click on the events tab. Okay, let me see. I think there are some questions here. Let me see what I can answer. Uh, did Vladka hide among Jews or non-Jewish partisans outside the ghetto? She, she hid outside the ghetto with non-Jews. All the Jews were supposed to be in the ghetto. So she had to pretend to be uh, not non-Jewish. Um, but she, there were also other non-Jews who were outside the wall. She was not the only one and she remained in contact with them part of this network that was operating outside the ghetto of the Jewish resistance. Um, to what extent did non-Jewish partisans help the Jewish resistance? Yeah, uh, there, there was a lot of help provided by non-Jewish Poles. Uh, some of you may remember we had a temporary exhibit here called Jagota, which was about a Polish resistance movement that helped, that was directed, overseen by non-Jews, but helped the Jewish partisans as well. Uh, so there was a lot of effort by the non-Jews to help the Jews, but there was also a lot of division. There was a division in terms of just the Jewish community, as I mentioned before, and there was division within the non-Jewish community about how much to help or in what ways to help, but uh, they did both work together. Um, oh, Merrill wants to come back and mention another story. Yeah, Merrill, you wanna come back? Sure. Yes, I'm very busy typing. Um, let me get the video on. Yeah, when, when, okay. It's not starting, the video's not starting. There you go, we can get you back here. Okay, let's go. I think it's coming. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Hi everybody, it reminded me, people are asking, Flotka had an apartment right outside the wall so she could look into it. And she found her many times outside the wall looking into it and wanting to be inside because when she was outside, she was always nervous because she could always get caught. So there was one thing she, she remarked about, she goes, she had to practice smiling with her eyes because her eyes would give her away. And inside she could relax because she didn't have to worry about hiding. And the one story that sneaks is she went out to, she left the ghetto smuggling out a child with her. She never left without bringing something out and bringing something back. And she had to bring explosives back and the explosives were wrapped in a package and she had to get that over the wall. But the package was bigger than the opening. So she's on top of the wall with another resistance fighter repackaging the explosives so they could get it through and hiding between the spotlights. And of course, she made it to the other side and the explosives got in. And there's one other story where she was smuggling a child out and she was on the trolley with him and he was getting nervous and she caused some sort of a fuss and she was able to get him off the bus and save him. 
and most of those are also in her book and she also has her complete testimonies uh, on the Shoah Foundation's website. That's it, Thorne, thank you. Excellent. I see a couple of other questions have come in. Come in. Did, uh, did Vladka Meet have siblings? Yes, she had a, a brother and a sister who were both murdered at Treblinka. And what prepared Vladka to take on her active resistance role? Yeah, I, that was, I think, just who she was. Um, I think there was also- well, Exactly. A... Go ahead, Mara. I was gonna say, yeah, what prepared her is she was active in the youth group. She was active with the labor movement. She was very bright. She, and once her family was murdered, she felt she had nothing to lose and she went in 100%. But she was drawn to, she was recruited because of her looks as well, because she was Aryan looking. Plus she was active in the youth groups and they knew her. So she was very willing and it was who she was inside. Like you said, thank you. I think for a lot of the members of the resistance, as time went on and family members were murdered, or it seemed more and more clear that they were going to be killed, that their willingness to fight became greater. And that certainly was the case, the fact that there were so many divisions within the Warsaw Ghetto. I mean, you're talking about a, a city of 450,000. So to, to have people come together was not easy, but as the Jewish population saw the reality of what was going on, it took some time for that to happen, there was more unity about the need to fight back. How common was it for women to join the armed resistance? You know, I, I don't know any statistics on how many were women versus men, but many were women. This was, everybody who wanted to fight back regardless of gender was, uh, was involved. And so oftentimes the fact that women were seen as perhaps being more likely to pass uh, and get around German uh, guards, maybe because they were prettier, whatever reason, the men had been an early target. And so women were a crucial part of the resistance movement. Okay, well, Merrill, thank you very much for adding to this program. Always nice to see you. And thank you everybody for listening. I look forward to seeing you at some of our other programs soon. Be well, thank you. <laughs>